In the northwestern United States, you will find the Columbia River watershed. It is approximately 258,000 square miles. It is the largest river flowing into the Pacific Ocean in North America. In the late 1920s, like the rest of the nation, the Pacific Northwest was in the midst of a depression, and building the proposed Grand Coulee Dam created thousands of jobs. With FDR's approval and allocation of funds, they began construction in 1933. Originally, the structure was approved for hydroelectric power only at a height set to be 150 feet. To achieve the irrigation goals and meet agricultural needs in central Washington, the dam had to be extended to 550 feet, making a fish ladder impossible. Just like the Long Lake Dam on the Spokane River, hatcheries below the blocked areas would supply fingerlings to support downstream fisheries but all of the tribes upstream of the dam would no longer have access to salmon in their ancestral waters. Not only were these decisions devastating to the salmon, they severely impacted the indigenous people of the Upper Columbia. The Ceremony of Tears, which lasted three days, brought indigenous people from all over to mourn the loss of the Kettle Falls, a historical tribal fishery which brought together hundreds of people from various tribes. Our ancestors were a river people, a salmon people. We, our subsistence came from the salmon, uh, 60, 70, 80 percent. And so we had so much that revolved around the salmon, so much culture, so much tradition, so much spiritual practices. Long Lake Dam, which was finished in 1915, had already cut off salmon to the eastern Upper Columbia tribes. The Spokane and the Coeur d'Alene tribes lost vital traditional fisheries. The Coeur d'Alene's are a salmon people and it's something that's been um, taken away from them because of the um, construction of um, hydro dams on the Spokane River in Columbia, but also um, habitat degradation through land, poor land practices. Pretty much um, obliterated um, all the available habitat for salmon. We had these spiritual and traditional practices that we had in our own language. And when the rivers were blocked and the salmon were stopped from coming up, we lost that. Phase one of salmon reintroduction consisted of a report with detailed analysis about such things as appropriate donor stocks, risk assessments, technology and facilities that are working at other large dams, and life cycle modeling for evaluating strategies for bringing salmon to the blocked areas of the Upper Columbia River. This report was completed May of 2019. With the report finished, the next step was to move forward to phase two. Um, for many years we've been working on uh, what we call the phased approach. That's kind of a systematic, long-term, science-based evaluation of feasibility um, in, in a stepwise approach to determine um, when and how and which fish and what's most likely to be successful. Um, and again, that's a long-term endeavor. Uh, what we realized fairly early on in that process is, is the tribes were, were anxious to get fish above Chief Joe and Grand Coulee. Uh, there were some other objectives uh, that the tribes had, such as having ceremonies, um, some educational and outreach uh, priorities. And so um, we began to work on a concept, what we call a parallel path of cultural and educational releases. So at the same time that we're working through the science and the policy uh, on the long-term fish passage and reintroduction aspect of the project, uh, we're able to, to get our hands on some fish, to move them upstream, uh, to begin to have some smaller scale studies, uh, but more importantly to be able to, for the tribes to have ceremonies. Uh, some of the tribes even had harvest efforts where tribal members were able to harvest salmon on the reservation for the first time in, in 80 to 110 years in the case of the Coeur d'Alene's and, and the Spokane's. Um, and so uh, it's really a, we sort of diversified the effort um, in order to meet multiple objectives. 
In 2016, the Upper Columbia Tribes held salmon ceremonies in which canoe journeys from each tribe's reservation was undertaken. This journey has since become an annual event. The year before I got on council, I got to uh, attend and be part of one of the canoe journeys. Um, the part that you know, I did, they did several sections all the way from Canada down and uh, vice versa. And it was, uh, it was great. There's, I forget how many canoes we have, but there's a lot and it, from all different tribes um, came to attend. These salmon ceremonies held at Kettle Falls Park were not only to acknowledge the loss to this fishery, but to pray for the salmon's return. Uh, last year with COVID, we weren't able to gather. And so the Inchlum Language and Culture Association held a virtual salmon ceremony, basically, and called on people everywhere to come down to their waters, regardless of whether they were on the Columbia River or where they were, and pray for the water. Pray for the salmon. Remember that that's our, that's our responsibility as indigenous people. In August of 2019, a couple of the Upper Columbia tribes began releasing adult Chinook salmon. Where we are now is a day use area uh, right downstream of Shimmikin Falls, which is located at about 100, 100 yards just around the bend. Um, this is the end of about a two and a half, three mile stretch uh, before the confluence of the Spokane River just downstream. In 2019, we provided a harvest opportunity for uh, Spokane tribal youth and elders. Uh, we sectioned off about a 300 yard stretch uh, downstream, just upstream, uh, to keep the fish confined so they'd be uh, remain accessible. And it was a uh, about the middle of August, beautiful summer day, and uh, it's an amazing opportunity to give the membership an opportunity they haven't had in the past, at least this generation. In 2019, we did have a cultural event where we released salmon into Shimmikin Creek, actually above where we're where I'm standing today, and. It was organized um, initially through our natural resource department, through our director and all of the, the staff there, and with assistance from some of the federal entities. So the idea was to do a release to teach the current day children and all of the tribal members who wanted to participate what it was like to have the salmon in the creek and what it was like back then and what type of um, cultural, traditional practices did we have. The Colville Confederated Tribes held three releases throughout the month of August. Their first release took place in Rufus Woods upstream of Chief Joseph Dam. Um, a lot of different people showed up from all, you know, from everywhere, not just tribal members, but locals and some people from the governor's office, I believe, showed up then. Uh, Northwest Power Council, there's some people from there. And then we get to release, you know, fish. How we did the um, release is they handed them down, and then they usually let the elders or um, some children release them. And seeing everyone just happy and excited, and getting to be part of, you know, something special. The fish haven't been up here for well above Grand Coulee for 80, 80 plus years, so it was a it was a big deal. The second release was held at the Keller Boat Launch into Lake Roosevelt upstream of Grand Coulee Dam.
and today is a cultural release. But I think it's important to mention that there has been work on Salmon Passage going on for many, many years. And I would like to The third salmon release ceremony was held at Kettle Falls Park, directly across the river from the ancestral fishing encampment. My uncle happened to be able to be one of the people to release the first salmon because he's an elder. He's in his late 80s now. So he was 85, I want to say, when, when he got to release that salmon across the river. My uh, parents actually got to tend to my brother, which was real special to me. My mom, she started uh, kind of crying and getting choked up. And, you know, I think it's just her thinking about my grandpa. He remembers Kettle Fall before it was inundated with water. So it was uh, pretty special for her to be part of that and get a help release one and just see everyone happy, see everyone, uh, all of our elders that were attending. Local schools have worked with hatcheries to get eyed up salmon eggs. The teachers created an egg to fry curriculum in their classrooms to teach the children about the salmon life cycle. Teaching kids young, I think, gives them that, you know, advantage to maybe want to even be in the natural resource field or, you know, like myself, I went to school for fisheries initially and ended up being a wildlife biologist, but I have fisheries background and um, trying to explain that to kids and get kids involved and get kids to actually come into our field, you know, field of work as becoming a biologist and also having that traditional knowledge, I think gives them an advantage to uh, being better at their job. When the salmon were nearly buttoned up, the children were allowed to release them into their local creeks. The kids raising salmon eggs in the classroom um, and being able to release those fish out into Hangman Creek and I, I really hope that that can continue and that um, it sparks the imagination of, of young people to um, want to pursue uh, jobs in natural resources and specifically want to try to restore salmon to the reservation. We were given salmon eggs. We, first, we started with trout. And from trout, we did that, I think, four years. Last year, I believe, was the first year that we did Chinook salmon. And um, so we're doing Chinook again. Some of them are going to float up. Oh my God. Oh my God, SpongeBob. Why are you caring about SpongeBob? So this year, they gave us 50 eggs. And what we did as a class, um, we got to um, figure out the temperature units per day to find out when the hatch day would be or around the hatch day. So we got to calculate doing that. So the kids get to learn the life cycle of the salmon. And this year they did them different. Um, because, and last year I should say, they did it different because they're salmon, they released them in Hangman's Creek. And then what they did is they give, they give the kids little Dixie cups with um, the fish in it. So every kid gets to release two or three fish. So they're in their little cups and they walk down to the stream, Hangman's Creek, and they, they get to let those fish go. <laughs> In the early summer of 2020, the Coeur d'Alene tribe held their first adult salmon release. something that 
we have longed for for many years. I remember Lawrence Nicodemus, Felix Arepa, speaking about the salmon that used to come up Hangman Creek, talking about these things that happened with us because it's so important. In our way, the first food is the salmon, and that salmon it nourishes our body. Myself and some of the other uh, department employees, we went, in the summer youth, we went over to the Mid-Columbia uh, Leavenworth Hatchery and brought back 75 adult Chinook and released them into Hangman Creek. And for the first time, again, in over 100 years, the Coraline people were able to fish in their own homeland for salmon. The interns, many of whom spent most of their high school career in the fisheries program, were given the opportunity to capture the first fish released. How uh, awesome it was when I got to be part of the, the salmon release when we did it uh, this past spring. It was it was so cool. Um, I know um, I know as tribes, you know, we we've lost a lot of our our, our ways and cultures, and you know, and especially with the dams and. Uh, what not the but it was such a very cool ideal for our departments to say let's let's reintroduce salmon and let's let our people go out there and, and catch them. Fish that we transported into Lake Roosevelt uh, were released at two different sites. We put 25 fish at uh, Geezer Beach, which is just upstream from Grand Coulee Dam, and another 25 fish uh, went in at Northport, Washington, which is up near the Canadian border. Uh, these fish were all uh, fitted with acoustic uh, tags. And there's a there's a an array of acoustic receivers throughout Lake Roosevelt that would allow us to detect their movements, and we we're trying to evaluate uh, how these fish would do and and, and where they would go uh, if we released them in in these two different locations. Additionally, we put another 100 fish into the Sampoil River uh, to evaluate uh, how those fish would, would respond in a, in a river environment where uh, that we translocated them into. Uh, we wanted to see how they would survive uh, through the late summer and into the, the fall spawning period, and then try to document uh, spawning in the fall. Yeah, so we released uh, 100 fish into the Sampoil River, uh, all with pit tags. Uh, we put them in two different uh, pools. We, had, we went upstream um, about 30 miles up the Sampoil River and found some pools that had uh, favorable temperatures. Uh, they went in in August, so we were concerned with, uh, we couldn't put them in the lower river because it was too warm. Uh, and so we found areas where they were easily accessible from the road that had adequate temperatures and then uh, put, put half the fish in one pool and half the fish in another pool. Um, and we chose those locations because they looked like they would be able to support these fish for the month, month and a half that they needed to be in the river holding before the spawn period. The primary difference in 2020 was that we couldn't have large gatherings, and so we weren't able to have a big tribal ceremony associated with the releases. Seventy-four.
So the, the, the hundred fish that we put in the Sam Poyle River uh, had pit tags and we have a pit tag detection array uh, near the mouth of the river and then in the West Fork. And so if the fish had swam upstream or downstream to leave the river, we, that, would, that pit tag array would allow us to determine that, that they had left the study area. And, and we did see a few fish that, that moved up and down, but the, most of the fish stayed near where they were released uh, during the summer holding period. And then we went out in October and walked the stream and we were able to document uh, quite a few spawning reds um, within about a, a six mile reach of the river near where they were released. At the same time, the Spokane tribe released adult salmon on their reservation with the intent to document survival and spawning. Earlier this summer, we released about uh, 100 summer Chinook uh, between this location and another location down the Spokane River. Uh, after we did some surveys earlier in October, we found about 20 reds scattered throughout Shimmikin Creek. And at that time, we also found carcasses. And so in the fall, it appeared that uh, after the fish were deceased, uh, scavengers came down to the creek, started to pull them out onto the bank, were already foraging on those carcasses. Uh, any carcasses left in stream would start to break down at this point. They'd be degrading, uh, contributing those nutrients back into the stream, back into the invertebrates. Uh, meanwhile, the eggs are gonna be incubating in their reds, um, just waiting to get enough thermal units until they hatch and emerge and they'll remain in the stream, at least into the spring um, and until runoff. One of the key things about salmon reintroduction is ensuring that they have the habitat that they need for not only spawning, but for rearing at those early life stages. Well, we know from some of our habitat assessments that a lot of the intrinsic potential for anadromous fish, it's largely gonna be in like the main stem of the sand poil and some of the larger tributaries. And we haven't done a lot of direct work there, but in 2017, we finished our, our prioritized restoration plan that uh, identified a number of reaches that do overlap, like the main stem of the sand poil. And we have uh, projects lined up for in-stream habitat structures like large wood placement, engineered log jams, and floodplain reconnection. So a lot of those should benefit, you know, spring Chinook, fall, summer, you know, there's going to be a, a large overlap with uh, steelhead and, and resident trout. There's a road network that bisects a lot of the habitat. And a lot of these older culverts are just inadequate for stream flows. And they weren't designed with fish passage in mind. River or creek system works is you have a floodplain that during the early spring when you have a lot of floods is that the floods go over the banks of the creeks or the river, go into the floodplains those floodplains then just store all kinds of water. Then when it gets to the hotter, drier months, then it slowly leaches that water back into the creek, uh, providing plenty of water throughout the year. Well, one of the things that the farms have done and farming practices have done is they've uh, decided that they can't farm those very well because it's so wet. So they, they put it in drain tile and they drain out those floodplains. And so when it floods, uh, typically, uh, those floodplains that are historically holding water now drain out super fast and, and makes it so that now during the summer hot months, we don't have a whole storage of water to, to feed the creeks. And so we have water quality issues, but we also have water quantity issues too. And um, both of those, uh, thankfully, can be restored by restoring the habitat. The problem with anything related to natural resources is everything takes 50 years to accomplish. And so... Um, one of the things that uh, we look at is saying we're going to probably end up doing this for uh, for the younger generations, making sure that they have that opportunity to harvest these fish, even, even if we can't uh, in our lifetimes. So each tribe sort of has their own program of, of, uh, of moving fish onto the reservation and into their waters. Um, but we're also all working together on, on sort of the, the bigger picture, larger effort uh, of the fish passage work. Future efforts include reintroducing and studying sockeye. Additionally, we will continue habitat restoration so that we can provide quality habitat for these reintroduced fish in their juvenile stages. The Spokane Tribe, the Colville Tribe, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe, and all the other Upper Columbia United Tribes have uh, looked at habitat availability and suitability for spring Chinook, 
steelhead, summer chinook, and sockeye. And really we see tremendous opportunity with sockeye reintroduction. Returning salmon to their ancestral habitat is a long-term endeavor. There's a lot of work to do with dam owners and operators to evaluate feasibility and develop passage facilities in order to achieve the tribe's vision of a future with salmon that don't have to be hauled in a truck in limited numbers.